everybody ready? Okay, well, thank all of you for coming, both of you for coming to this uh, press conference. There's been a lot of coverage of marijuana issues this year in New Hampshire, and what I hope will happen today is we'll be able to refocus some of that attention onto the plight of patients who are still suffering without state legal access or any legal protection, in fact, despite passage of New Hampshire's therapeutic use of cannabis law. That law was signed in July, uh, July 23rd of 2013, and nine months later, here we are asking the same questions we were asking a year ago, and that in fact many of the people standing behind me have been asking for years. Is it okay if we go ahead and grow a couple of plants just for ourselves while we're waiting for this regulated system? to be created. I talked to Clayton Holton last week. He's come to the State House every year since 2007. Uh, Clayton's down to 60 pounds. He's very unable to eat, very concerned about how long he's going to make it. He's unable to travel at this point. The only thing that stimulates his, his appetite is being able to eat a, a small amount of cannabis. Uh, Without access to that, he relies on Oxycontin and other prescriptions for pain relief. They take away his pain, but they make him nauseous and uh, hurt his appetite even more. So if any of us here went to take Clayton a brownie or a cookie, we'd be committing a felony. We could be prosecuted, uh, charged with up to three years in jail, fined up to $25,000. So that's what this is about. This is the most limited home cultivation bill that's ever been before the legislature. It only allows two mature plants per patient. It only allows two mature plants until an alternative treatment center opens within 30 miles of the patient's res residence. For most patients, this is a limited and temporary option until ATCs get up and running. I'd like to introduce the prime sponsor, Representative Ted Wright from Tuffenberg. Thank you, Matt. I'm Ted Wright. Um, as Prime sponsor, I, uh, I introduced three elements to this bill. There's the home cultivation option that allows patients, like Matt said, to grow two plants under very limited conditions. It gives patients an affirmative defense uh, uh, to protect them from arrest or for, from conviction. And it adds four conditions to the list. Uh, <clears throat> Parkinson's, lupus, epilepsy, and um, oh, Alzheimer's, the uh, dementia that's related to Alzheimer's. Uh, I'm also here as the caregiver of a patient. My wife has stage four metastatic breast cancer, and five years ago we were in a position where uh, it had spread to the bones of her chest, her hips, her pelvis, and her back. And she became involved in a phase one clinical trial that was a game changer. It, it changed everything. The problem was it made her sick. And she couldn't eat. And after exhausting all the possible medications that they had provided for her, nothing worked. And uh, at the recommendation of a nurse, she tried cannabis. And within 10 minutes, she was eating the biggest meal I'd seen her eat in over a year. And that's what brought me down here. And that's why we need access now, not years from now. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Next, we have a patient, uh, Frank Payne. Take up work. Yes, my name is Frank Payne. That's P-A-I-N-E. I'm a retired senior bank examiner for the Federal Reserve System. I've had a chronic pain condition for about 20 years. For about half of that, it's been treated with prescription narcotics, but all kinds of other things that you can imagine. Everything that I'm aware of, except cannabis. I have not done that because of the personal policy. I will not treat myself illegally. Beyond that, though, I'm particularly sympathetic with people who are much more seriously off than I am. I am not in a life-threatening situation. I can eat, I can walk, I can drive a car. I 
really feel though, for people who are in a position where they're in pain all the time, because I'm familiar with that, and I'm also very conscious of the fact that people in with chronic pain of that sort cannot be productive and contribute to themselves, their families, and the community they live in. So I think it's actually cruel, unnecessarily cruel, to prevent people in that situation from having access to cannabis which can help their, give them some relief. And that's what I have to say and why I'm strongly in support of this bill. Thank you. Next we have Christine Lopez, who arrived just in time for her turn. <laughs> this is a microphone. Right there. That's right. Hi, I'm Christine Lopez. I've been paralyzed for over two years, and uh, because of that I have, uh, one of the things I have is severe muscle spasms. I found that uh, medical marijuana helps me to relax and live a lot more comfortable lifestyle. And I really would appreciate being able to grow my own medicine so that I can have the relief that I need. Thank you. Anybody else? I will. Okay. Kirk McNeil. You have a copy of this particular document in your press packet, so I won't read through the whole thing. And yes, Matt has one of those for you. There are a lot of problems with the delays that we've experienced in getting medical marijuana first passed and now actually to a point where it can be implemented. And this is a bill that will help out with that problem. The only advantage that I can see in it taking this long to get this far is that we have a record now. And just to make sure that the list is on the record, Senator Bradley, Senator Sanborn, Senator Bragdon, Senator Reagan, Senator Stiles, Senator Kelly, Senator Gilmore, Senator Lasky, Senator Larson, Senator Fuller Clark, Senator Delessandro, Senator Pierce, and Senator Cataldo have all supported grow your own bills with more plants than the two in this bill in the past. When you look at this piece of paper, you'll see the dates and you'll see the details of that. At this point in the game, we don't just expect their support, we expect their advocacy on this matter. Thank you. Anybody else? I will ask you. Donna. Hi, my name is Donna Priolo, and I was diagnosed in 2005 with stage 3 breast cancer. Um, many, many treatments, radiation, chemotherapy, surgeries, and my husband grew for me clean organic marijuana, and I used that through my treatments. Um, since then, he had uh, has been diagnosed with hepatitis C, and he was growing his own plants for his treatments when um, he was arrested for it. Um, our daughter called the police out of rebellion, and uh, we just finished our fight with that. Um, he was uh, he got a misdemeanor with no fine and no uh, jail time, and. Um, we are relieved with the outcome of that. Thankfully, we had jury nullification on our side to help fight against that. But uh, we did not need to go that far. Um, anyways, the, the cannabis has helped me greatly through all my um, side effects from prescriptions and the chemotherapy that I had to endure um, for a couple years. And I still would like to use it um, for many of the long-term effects that I'll have through my body, through my life. Um, so I am fighting for me and for my husband, as well as all of my friends that I've met um, through this fight that I know would benefit from this. And the best way is for us to grow our own and to make sure it's clean and safe ourselves and to choose and decide what we want to have. Thank you. Now we will happily take any questions. Or you may interview us individually. Thank you so much. Could, could you speak to uh, the intransigence of uh, yet another ostensibly liberal governor on an issue that should historically be right in their wheelhouse? 
Well, I won't comment on the politics of it. My goal all along has been to convince everybody in this state that patients should be protected from arrest and have safe legal access to cannabis for therapeutic use. I don't care if people are liberal, conservative, moderate, or any other ism that you can come up with. It doesn't matter. People should be able to grow two plants, take care of themselves if their doctors recommend or believe they can benefit from using cannabis. So we're going to try to convince a supermajority in the Senate, understanding that the governor has uh, opposed home cultivation. Certainly last year, we think getting more than two thirds in the Senate is probably a good way to change her mind, given that it passed the House with 76%. So that's what we'll aim for is unanimity among the Senate, if at all possible. Thanks. Anybody else? Media? <laughs> Once again, everybody, from the top. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Well, that was a rehearsal. <laughs> we have 15 minutes before the hearing, so if there are no more questions, we'll adjourn and let you talk to us individually. Thanks. I don't forget to. Thanks. Okay, I welcome the hearing on House Bill 1622 and recognize the county sponsor, Representative Mark. Thank you. Can I approach? So I have a, an amendment for this, it's a housekeeping issue. Okay. I've got plenty of copies. Oh, you do have plenty of copies? Actually, I should keep a You got one? I'll discuss that after. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chairman. For the record, I, my name is Ted Wright. I represent Carroll County District 8. And I'm the prime sponsor of 1622, a bill that will do several things. Uh, first, it will allow patients to grow a very limited amount of cannabis for their own use. Uh, it will, two plants is what we're looking at, and 12 seedlings. It will be, it will allow towns to use the health official, local health official to oversee, so they can actually go into a grow site and make sure that they're on board with all the rules. Uh, this was a compromise position from allowing law enforcement into a home because of Fourth Amendment issues and everything, but this person will give us somebody, boots on the ground, if you will, to, to ensure that a compliance. Um, the the second thing is it's an affirmative defense that was stripped out of the last bill that it will allow patients to uh, with a with a certification from their provider protection under the law. <coughs> right now, patients are not protected, and this is a temporary measure until ID cards are issue. Uh, there's been a setback in that area. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the AG has come out and told DHHS that they will not be allowed to issue ID cards, which is our protection, until dispensaries are up and running. Uh, the, th the third thing is that I've added four qualifications. Two of them are new conditions and two of them are to clarify uh, existing conditions. Um, Alzheimer's was on the list of illnesses, but there was no um, symptom related to Alzheimer's. And you have to have both because of the word and. Uh, so I added all, uh, dementia related to Alzheimer's specifically. And then uh, the same thing with just a, kind of the opposite with epilepsy. We had seizure disorders under the symptoms but no illness so I added epilepsy and the other two are clearly defined and easily diagnosed Parkinson's and lupus both of which I understand can benefit from this um, that's pretty much it for the bill I, I'm not sure I, if you if you have any questions I'd be glad to answer them if not I can go into what the amendment is all about Okay, um, the amendment, if you look at 
page 2, line 23 on the original bill. It has one, one flowering cannabis plant, one non-flowering cannabis plant. We're going to, the idea is to uh, change that to two mature cannabis plants and 12 seedlings. It, if you look later on, on page 3, line 2, that same verbiage is there. So it's just matching the two up. It, it didn't, uh, they, they didn't match. So the line on page 2 matches the line on page 4. With this amendment, it looked right. Any questions of the committee? I apologize, Representative. Thank you. But Sir. Um, your amendment um, 1275, two mature plants, 12 seedlings, total canopy of 50 square feet. Yes. Um, line 23 says two mature plants, 12 seedlings, total canopy of no more than 50 square feet. It sounds like it's the same language. Um, this I pulled off the table. Yes, sir. Uh, page 3, line 2. Yeah. Two mature yeah. cannabis plants, 12 seedlings, total canopy number. Right, and you can. Be consistent. Okay. If you go back to page two, line 23. Two mature cannabis plants, 12 seedlings, total canopy number. Line 23. Line 23. Line 23. Okay. One flowering cannabis plant, one non flowering. That was, I don't know how well, it's funny because we thought we had this corrected in the house with an amendment, but it didn't show up online or and it wasn't on. It says as an adult health. Right. Do you have the original name? That was introduced. Maybe it fell off. Oh. Does that happen? Yeah. Yep, we're good. Okay. All right, sir. No worries. Right, right. Something. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to welcome all these folks here to Senate Health. Uh, I've been an active supporter and have been working for, this is probably year six, of trying to get a plant available for use by very sick people. So that's the effort here is once again to present it to powers higher than us to express the intent of the legislature to bring relief to really sick people. So I just encourage you as my fellow committee members to support that when we go to exec session. Questions of the committee? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, thank you for your good work on this. As you know, how I feel about it. Um, let me play devil's advocate. Those who wouldn't support this would may say something to the extent that essentially this is allowing people to produce their own prescription medication or to create their own drugs. And how do we answer that? You know, I answer that. How do you believe we? Should I think it was up till Matt Cruz, nineteen to thirty-seven. The cannabis was prescribed by every doctor and carried by every pharmacy in the United States. It was used for everything that people found it beneficial for, and all of a sudden it became taboo, which we believe the prohibition had had racial overtones to it. To the genesis of that. So it's, and then at that same time, all of the experience 
and now of course all those prescribers are all gone and all that experience has all tragically disappeared from the pharmacopoeia and the formularies and the everywhere and all the things we knew are now have all disappeared so it's it's just tragedy of it's a tragic government action that's visited tragic people with tragic circumstances who can get relief from a weed growing out of the ground and it's just it's just all around sad and it's borders on negligence by the government to have ever permitted this to ever happen in the first place. So, and now we're all working, we're working from the grassroots up trying to get this back in a, in a state that it enjoyed acceptance and efficacy in the whole United States up until the mid-30s. Thank you, sir. Further questions for the Seeing none, we'll keep the chair warm. Chair will recognize Representative Schlackman. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm Donna Schlackman, Rockingham District Number 18, and I had the same cell phone tune. Good taste. Mm -hmm. I thought it was mine. Um, I'm here today really because I want to speak a little bit to the legislative intent um, of our original legislation and also some of the things that are happening right now. And I think that you all appreciate because you worked really hard on the bill that we have that the legislative intent was to make cannabis available to um, people in need through um, medical providers. And it was also, there was a lot of pages on protection, and some of those were taken out, but um, it was protection for patients in terms of the ATCs. All those regulations were wanting to make sure that we weren't um, licensing an entity in the state that was not re well regulated in terms of the health aspects and in terms of diversion. Um, we, did not, we did not express concerns about self growth um, safety and regulations. We didn't put any provisions in there about having the health department um, make sure that those plans were okay. Um, so that was the self grow that had been in the original bill didn't worry about that. And I just want to point that out. And I want to just speak to your issue about letting people grow their own medication. We self-medicate all the time. Um, some of us self-medicate with plants that we have gotten at the health food store and we combine them for things to cure our, our sore throats or our colds or our stomach ailments. And then there are people who self-medicate with other legal products called beer and alcohol. And we even make some of that at home. So um, while it's a leap because this one is federally illegal, I don't think self-medication is a stranger to us, whether we do it well or not. Some of us self-medicate at the end of the day just to relax. These people are self-medicating right now to, to deal with not relaxation as we do, but significant ailment, pain, nausea, and all the other things. Um, so I just wanted to diverge a little bit and point that out. I need you to I, um, I wasn't really gonna speak on, on this one because I actually have an amendment to your Senate bill to try to deal with the registry cards, but but um, I see that this does deal with the registry cards and I think it deals with it in a really important way. If you look at our current law and you look at the section um, 126, sorry, it's on this page, uh, two, where it's the definitions and, and oh, I'm sorry, the therapeutic use of cannabis protections and you go down to Roman numeral five, on our current lawn that you probably don't have that in front of you unless you have a tablet and you can get it up quickly, which I encourage you to do. It's, uh, it's section two, 126X colon two, Roman numeral five. You will notice, and I'll just talk as you're getting it, that patients from other states that visit New Hampshire that have um, an identification card or its equivalent that's issued under the laws of another state are currently in New Hampshire protected. Can you give me the RSA? 
It's it's one twenty. I'm sorry, one twenty six is the RSA. Is one twenty six what? X. So it's one twenty six X. But if you just go to one twenty six on the website, you'll get to it faster. It's about the third one twenty six down. No, it's alphabetical, so it would be all the way to yeah. bottom. Oh, not, not on my computer. computer. <coughs> Here, well, wow, we that's so okay. funny. Okay. Um, so, so 126 X colon two. 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 Okay. Section five. So section five. Yeah. A I person otherwise entitled to custody. Therapeutic use of cannabis protections. A valid registry identification card. That's how Great. it starts. It's Roman numeral five. Roman, Roman numeral five. five. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. So if you read that section as I read it. Visiting patients have protections if they are stopped. Our patients don't. Um, so what you're saying is because they, they cannot be issued a card right now. Right. If I come from a state, another state, I have Vermont, protection. Maine, Maine, grow your own. Uh -huh. Come to visit a friend. Bring your prescription or your. The AG has ruled that until. Until the, the AG has ruled that until the ATCs are open, yeah. that there's that the department is not to register to issue cards. Now, th this goes back to the legislative intent, because the way the bill was crafted and written, we clearly expected patients to have the option of growing their own or getting it from an ATC if they were going to, hmm? Initially. Initially. So a lot of this, a lot of this went, and, and frankly, we were under the gun for time. So this may be one of those things we didn't notice, that we were actually granting out-of-state residents more protection than our in-state residents. But I have to say personally, as someone who worked on this bill a lot, I was never under the impression that people were only going to get cannabis those two places, even with ATCs opening or growing their own, because it's not easy. That not knowing the price, not knowing what the competitive market would or would not do, even though those were nonprofit centers, not knowing where the price points were going to be, there might always be patients who would opt to get it somewhere else in some other way. And right now, because the cards can't be issued, people who need it are going to get it. People, I mean, we have patients all the time who go to their doctors and, and the doctors say, quietly, or the nurses, see if you can get some cannabis somewhere. We know we have cancer patients. We have people sitting in this room probably or standing who are using, and we do nothing to provide them with protections. Now, what I have heard through the grapevine is the police are really not bothering patients. They, that's not a priority. It's not on their radar. It's not something they are concerned about, which may or may not be true, given what we know in the news lately with heroin. We certainly hope they're not using their resources going after patients. But I think, at the very least, our citizens should be entitled to the protections that others have. And that even if we didn't have that error in our law, we certainly should be concerned with protecting them, regardless of where they're getting their cannabis, because a lot of them are doing it <coughs> under medical advice. And that's the reality. So the piece that I like in this is on page four, all that language, which basically says they're protected if they've applied for a card. Now, the bill that I have attached to your Senate Bill 234, which does some stuff with the bill, is, is to say that those cards need to be, they need to start issuing those cards this July, and that, and whether, and taking out the words that say you have to designate an ATC on the card, because that's what we did. We were so concerned about diversion from the ATCs, not, conver not diversion from people's homes. The conversations was diversion from ATCs mostly. We were so concerned with that that we didn't want people ATC shopping. We didn't want them to go to several and get their minimum or maximum amount. So we said on our, on, in the statute about the registry cards, you have to say which ATC you're using. And we were also going to use the ATCs as a way of collecting some information and data and learning more. And so we were developing a relationship between patients who, who elected to use ATCs and what they were doing. So the amendment I have in strips out the language that the card has to identify an ATC. So it, so it gives them the power to start issuing the cards. But at the very least, if my amendment goes down, 
This, this, this does the same thing. It, it provides protections to patients, which is what we should be concerned about. Let's, let's be real, let's be realistic about what's happening and who's using it and, and how they're using it effectively and stop denying what we set out to do, which was to get, give patients access. Um, so that's really what I was concerned about in my reason for sitting here and... Thank you um, so much, Representative. Um, so just in really trying to understand the intent of this legislation, if in fact the eight, we call them ATCs, correct, were open, this would not be an issue. Um, Maybe part of your <coughs> amendment would, but the, in, the, re, the real intent of a temp, what we're trying to do is fill a gap. Yes. And yes. so and if we could have moved those up to where they need to be, which was the original intent from the legislation that did pass, we may not be having this discussion. We might have pieces of the discussion, but we wouldn't have this large discussion. Not as large, and, and, and I think that's a good point, but the problem is that um, we don't know when they're going to open. So if, you know, is there a sunset? I don't know, you know, but something that would give patients the ability to legally access cannabis now, whether it's growing it themselves or on the legal, illegal market, but giving them access and giving them the protection now. And then if you want to say, and when the ATCs are open, you know, because you can always revisit it then. But absolutely, and that could take a very, very long time. We know that from other states. We knew that going in, which is why we wanted the self-grow option right from the beginning, because we knew, no matter how optimistic the timeline we put in the bill, and I know Michael Holt from DHHS and all those staff are working as hard as they can work, we knew that we were being optimistic and it could take a really long time. So. Well, just uh, really kind of a comment and a question then to you would be that um, you know passing legislation like this is difficult, getting mm -hmm. people together, getting it signed all the way through and a bill and a law passed takes a lot of time, takes a lot of energy, even though the intent of it is meant for the good, there's no question. Would we be better off putting a lot more energy in our time into getting the ATCs open, which was what originally we wanted to do to solve the problem, and could we do that? Because we know then that there's access, um, there will always be some. We knew that when we passed it, there might be a time frame here or some that would fall through that, that gap. But from what I'm hearing is the gap is getting larger. Wondering well, if we can put our time and energy into closing that gap and not having to then move this forward, which is going to be difficult, and you know that. Well, then maybe we need to go back to the amendment I have on the other bill, which is issuing the cards in July with no ATCs designated, because as much as you want to put energy into opening up those ATCs, we could put all the energy we want. It's a business. It has to get up and running. It has a lot of restrictions around it. We still could be looking out 18 months or two years, even from this point, which is a year out from passing the law. So I think that we can't just say, well, we know it's a bad situation, and we'll just put all our, I, I know, I'm sorry. But, but I think that no matter how quickly we need to do, we do that, we need to right now, whether it's amending this legislation or another piece of legislation, the, the House and Senate needs to do something to protect patients now and to give them access now. I really feel that very strongly. Um, and I appreciate, I appreciate what you're saying. I, I really do. And I appreciate the, the difficulty we had getting even to the point we're at. But there are people in this room who have waited and waited, and we have nothing, not even protections that, as I said, we give to out-of-state patients right now. We have no idea what the status of the agency is going on. I think that you have someone from the Department of Health and Human Services here who will be able to answer that question. But, uh, yeah. So, no more first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, sir. Was. Um, I actually have two questions, oh. Representative Shockman. So, the conundrum is if you, deli if you issue a card now, you're issuing a card for something for which there's no legal access. So you're asking the, the Department of Health and Human Services to engage in something that has no legal opportunity. Is that right? That's the conundrum. 
first, well, let me just back up a minute. The expectation, the timeline, if you read the bill, the timeline was that the cards were going to be issued six months ahead of the ATC's opening anyway on our most optimistic timeline. And the reason was that we didn't want to have those doors open and nobody able to go through them. But yes, in a way, you're issuing a card um, with no legal access. But I, I don't frankly think, I think what we were doing in passing this legislation was to make people realize that they're not criminals in the eyes of the state, even if they are in the eyes of the federal law. But I think our most driving force behind the legislation was access all along. Just give them access. Just protect them from being arrested. As I said in my opening, I don't think that we even pretended that people, some people weren't going to still do it other ways. So I just think that it's not up to the Department of Health and Human Service to, to that's not their, wor their worry, it's our worry. I think we are the ones that have the ability to say to these patients, we're going to make sure the state gives you a card because we're going to make sure that you are not subject to arrest. That's our responsibility, <coughs> not DHHS. So, you know, we chose to have them be the, the card issuers. We could have maybe had law enforcement be the card issuers for that matter, but, you know, it's, it's, it's the protection that we're after. So I think that's just critical. Yes. Do you have another uh, you have question? Another question? I do. Just quickly, um, I, I noticed the uh, dementia associated with Alzheimer's disease um, where, we've, where we've identified earlier it is the agitation uh, produced by the Alzheimer's disease. I'm not clear on what's the clinical efficacy of the dementia. Um, you really would have to ask the sponsor about that language, but I will tell you as someone who watched her mother um, with Alzheimer's from the age my mother was 52 and died at 78, um, and watched the, the association between dementia and agitation and paranoia and behavior, um, which came first. So, you know, I think it's up to the, I think it's up to the medical providers, frankly. And if, so why, why this is dementia? Because agitation isn't the only thing. <coughs> My mother wasn't very agitated when she was extremely paranoid, which made about five years of her life unbearable for everybody. That was, that was the dementia. You know, agitation came in other forms at other points in the disease process. But, um, you know, that's just my personal story. But I, but I do, I'm glad you brought that up because I think it's important that the legislature be the body that adds the things. The, the, we, the other part of the AG's report to the DHHS and what they can do um, basically is giving the department the ability to decide what conditions go in. And I, again, it, I think it was the legislative intent that we were not asking the department to practice medicine and decide which conditions are qualifying. We are asking them to accept from a physician or a nurse, their their um, write up, their, their you know, fill out the form and say this is a person with, with this, and this is why we it it may not fit in. You know that exception. We're going to the exception part, which was letter B, I think, or C. Am I rambling? Are you following me here? Okay. The reason there are these is that it. It was up to us all to decide, us all, right, to decide what 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 was going to be added, not the department. And I think the attorney general, if you have that, do you have that report? If you read the report, it it puts in the department's hands power to decide conditions. That I felt was the power of the legislature because we worked really hard with the medical society on that on that qualifying condition section and how it was going to work. And then we worked really hard with them on language in the bill, and I'm sorry I can't rattle it off right now, which says if, the, if a provider has a patient that doesn't fit into that, they can send the documentation in so that the card can be issued. So I think that um, this is the time for us to add more language because it's our job. Um, I'm going to try and politely call out the elephant in the room, and I don't mean to disrespect it, anyone. I constantly feel that one of the frustrations that we can can you know dance around a little bit is um, less support on this issue from the governor than a lot of people would like in this room, and 
my concern is, or I guess my question is, does the governor support accelerating some of these things so that at the end of the day it sits on her lap and she's been pretty slow in embracing all the things we've been talking about for six years, mm -hmm. or for me for four years. Mm -hmm. So I feel there's very broad support in this room. I feel there's very broad support for everyone who's continued to work on this, but the, the, the governor's not on board and she hasn't really been fully on board and I'm concerned about that. And I'm concerned that if we're accelerating conditions already and we're accelerating access to cards, although you know I'm supportive of this 100%, so it's not where I am. Is the governor gonna sign this? I have not had the privilege of having a conversation with the governor or any of the governor's staff, so I really cannot at all speak to that. All I can say is um, I don't feel that if, it, if at the very least you just focus on the protections to patients, I don't <coughs> see that that is changing access and use at all in the state because, the re as I said, the reality of it is that most well, maybe it isn't the reality. Maybe that's just my assumption that people in need that have medical providers that's saying, this is what I want you to do, and I want you, if you have to go to Vermont or you have to go to Maine, please do so. You know, that's happening now. So I would think that, if, that that should be the primary focus of all of us, not whether or not we're going to get the governor's cooperation. I think that we have all been in the position of being in the House or the Senate where we have done what we believe <coughs> legislatively was the appropriate thing and had a governor say, no, I don't think it is, and we come back and say, yeah, we really do. Well, as I'm concerned that there doesn't exist the override capacity on this bill, um, I guess I just, I just I raise the caution that if, you know, what's more, I don't want to say what's more important, that'd be disingenuous, but expanding a lot of things in here without the governor essentially supporting what's happening today at some level um, is it more important to focus it back down to some things that we know she would support versus risk taking a, a bigger bite of the apple and having her come back and saying i don't support that provision so you can lose all this as well and i guess i guess that's my concern is are we going from protection to now it's a bigger bite of the apple and we would have gotten this She's been so unsupportive. We're definitely not getting that. So then we lose everything. So uh, as a committee member, I guess m my question is, it's, someone's got to get in front of the governor and say, look, mm -hmm. on and above the fact that, man, you need to get on board with this stuff because right. you're hurting these people for not doing it. Right. We're trying to make some changes here. And are you buying all the way in? Are you buying halfway in? Because I don't want to see the whole thing die. Right. Uh, am I making sense? You're absolutely making sense. And I truly, truly appreciate that because as I've said for the how many minutes I've been sitting here. My concern is making sure patients are protected regardless of how they get access. So um, if that's the little piece that you think you can save, that's at least what we need to do. But our focus, our focus as a legislature should be doing what we feel is in the best interest of patients. And I, I believe having a home grow component is in the best interest of patients, frankly. So I can't tell you what to do. I can tell you what the House decided to do. And um, I, I actually not, I'd have to go back and see what my vote was on this bill. I didn't realize until a few weeks ago how badly we were doing in terms of getting that access to patients. I apologize to everybody behind me. You all were not on my radar with regard to that. I thought things were moving along really well until I saw, heard about the, govern the Attorney General's ruling to the advisory committee on what DHHS can and cannot do. And then I started looking into it more and I went, this is not where we thought we'd be a year later. If, if this I was could, not our intent. I apologize to mm. but then a lot of people on speak and I want to finish so I can have people away. Um, I hear you and I understand saying, look, we need to do what we think is in best for the best for the constituency that we represent. Um, and I fully appreciate that. But at the end of the day, this is going to come down to the governor's desk. And so I guess I make the official ask if you and Senator Reagan and the prime can get with the governor and ask at what threshold we can 
find her level of comfort for this because I'm hesitant to jump this thing forward if she's just going to kill it. You know that because then we haven't moved the ball forward at any level whatsoever. And as much as I want to, and everyone here wants to do the right thing for people, and I think this committee has a pretty long established practice of being there. Um, I don't want us to swing for the fence knowing that we could have been happy with a double. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So if you guys could get with her and see pushing her would be nice, but um, see where we what what we can what she can live with because I think she continues to be the holdup on this. Okay. Senator Keller. Yes, I, I just want to be on the record that I think discussing where the governor is and putting this legislation as our discussions today on uh, bringing the governor, whoever the governor is, into the discussion is inappropriate. I disagree we with that fundamentally. She weighs in on stuff we, all the time. Excuse me. I didn't interrupt you. Well, Senator. you're going to criticize me. We'll have that discussion, Senator. Senator. Well, I'm happy to. Uh, we have separate responsibilities and that's what makes this process work and that's what democracy is all about and I think that we need your testimony to this committee which is the Senate bringing information from the House is the process and then we move forward with that and I just for the record want to say that uh, uh, I think it's inappropriate thank you and for the Our record I, for the record I'd like to say it's very inappropriate because we hear the governor talk about her desire to veto stuff all the time so it would be wasting this body's time for the governor who has weighed in on several issues ahead of the vote of any legislature Senator to Sandler, continue with it. You heard what you said. Thank you. Uh, Representative, did I understand you to say you have, uh, there's another piece of legislation that would move the card? Forward? You have Senate Bill 236, 234 out of this committee, which um, um, deals with the, jeez, uh, what was the underlying bill? Somebody remind me. Um, no, no, I'm sorry, it, it's completely escaping me, but I, and it's not undermined to dealing, I just added, I didn't change what you had passed out of the committee, but I have an amendment coming in on Thursday, actually. In the House? To the House, yes, because it's already gone through the Senate, right. so if you can look it up quickly, I'm just having them. You know. 234? Yes. Relative to procedural changes in the law governing therapy use of cannabis. Yeah, but I and the content. Do you want to just refresh all of us? Okay. Well, we'll okay. We'll so we'll what I have coming we'll in as an amendment to that is looking at the the section that deals with the registry cards for the patients and the qualifying providers, taking out the language that requires an ATC to be put on that card, which would give DHHS the ability to actually issue cards because they no longer have that requirement, and also says that those cards will be issued no later, or they will start, I'm sorry, accepting applications for the cards no later than July 23rd or 4th of this year, because we already have in the law, once the application has been submitted, they have five days to issue the card. So it takes care of that problem and provides the protection. So I'm hoping that the Senate will look at that as a friendly amendment because it doesn't, doesn't, what was the substance of that one? Did you look? Um, 234. Yeah, it says it inserts deadlines for submitting a criminal history records check. That's right. That's what it is. It, 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 it clarifies and has stronger language about criminal background checks. So. Uh, so questions are okay? Thank you, Thank you for your time. I'm just saying we're down the list. We have about 12 people who would like to speak, so I'd like to kind of move this along. I have Representative Mayor um, in support of not speaking. I have Devin Shaffey in support but not speaking. I have Elizabeth Sargent opposed and not speaking. I have John. And Carrasco. Thank you. <laughs> opposed and speaking. Okay. Is that Good a Is that a Yes. <coughs> My name is Johnny Canasio. I'm a lieutenant with the state police and currently the uh, commander of the drug unit. I'm here representing the Department of Safety today. I have a position paper from Assistant Commissioner Sweeney. And I can just touch briefly on that paper in the essence of time. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. 
the position of the Department of Safety is uh, remains the same that this bill should not pass and we are opposed to it. Um, it's basically increasing the amount of, of uh, allowable cannabis. Uh, it's going to require regulators to become proficient in the identification of these plants. Uh, immediately it's going to increase the number of DHH uh, DHHS staff requiring uh, requiring them to perform quarterly inspections. It's also going to increase the burden on law enforcement uh, if we get involved to show up and remove excess amounts. Most importantly, a proper process for possessing a medical marijuana card has already been established. We haven't given it enough time to get up and running to even know if that's going to be effective, or what changes need to be made. If you pass this bill, you will already be creating the first of what will probably be many purpose of purposeful loopholes, and it makes us wonder just how serious the state will be looking down the road in supporting proper controls. The state lacks the enforcement infrastructure to control, monitor, and inspect the increased number of sites that the bill will create and increases the very real possibility of an increased level of criminal trespass, burglary, and theft. Additionally, the Medical Society originally opposed this bill. Administrative rules have not been written yet and the full extent of the law hasn't taken effect. We ask that you give that process a chance and we move forward at that time with any amendments to the law. Questions of the committee? Thank you very much. Thank you. Bill Allen? Uh, 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 Ms. Butler not speaking. Kirk. McNeil. McNeil. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I'll be as brief as I possibly can be, um, and when I'm done, I'll circulate this uh, written testimony to you guys. Uh, just so you know, we had a press conference here just before this hearing, and this is a portion of what we handed out to the press. Um, I do want to address two things that came up, um, not specifically regarding the governor, but regarding the executive branch because one thing that you mentioned, Senator Kelly, is is there a way to move this process along? That clearly the intent of the legislature is being delayed by the executive branch. Um, and then one thing that Senator Sanborn mentioned was, you know, how far away are we from a veto-proof majority, essentially? The answer is three. And I'm going to hand out this piece of paper so that you guys can take a look at it. And then I'll just hit a few highlights on it. Essentially, uh, what this sheet addresses is the fact that Senator Bradley, Senator Sanborn, Senator Bragdon, Senator Reagan, Senator Stiles, Senator Kelly, Senator Gilmore, Senator Lasky, Senator Larson, Senator Fuller Clark, Senator D'Alessandro, Senator Pierce, and Senator Cataldo have all supported more aggressive grow your own bills than we currently have in front of you today. At this point, the patients aren't really asking you to support this bill, they're asking you to be advocates for this bill and to help push it forward and to help find those other three people to give this a veto-proof majority. Um, it's pretty clear that the patient's are, needs are not being addressed. It's pretty clear that the intent of the legislature with the previous medical marijuana bill is being delayed by the executive branch. And I think that it's important that you send a message to the executive branch that a right delayed is a right denied as Martin Luther King once said. I would also like to mention just briefly that if for some reason you don't feel like this is the bill you can pass, you obviously have another choice, and that would be 1625, which is decriminalization. Thank you very much. Take any questions. Mr. Zilipetti. Thank you, and thank you for sharing this with us. Thank you. Thank you.
you have written testimony, if you can just summarize it, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, well, I would like to give you a little background. I was hoping to read from that, but if you'd like me to summarize it, uh, I will. Okay. Um, it should take about five minutes to read this. Okay. Um, I am Dwight DeVork of Wolfboro, New Hampshire. I am a native of Wolfboro, and I'm now in my 61st year. I am an insurance agency owner, a landlord, a husband to my wife of 31 years, and a father to my daughter of 30 years with a serious cancer history. I'm here today to urge you to support HB 1622 for some very good reasons, starting with my own daughter's special medical needs. My daughter has been battling bone cancer now for 12 years. She was first diagnosed with osteosarcoma of the sacrum and the iliac in 2002, and while just 18, starting her freshman year at college as a music major. She had been a very talented and promising musician as a high school student and was accepted to three very well-known schools as a music major. Unfortunately, her, her future as a musician came to a screeching halt when she was diagnosed with bone cancer in the base of her spine. Back then, her prospects for, sur for survival were very slim. About 20% of those people survived with chemo uh, chemotherapy and radiation. She and her pa parents were very lucky for the expert medical care she received at the Children's Hospital and at Dana-Farber and the Mass General Hospital. After a year of inpatient care, inpatient care for a year with chemo and radiation, she pulled through. She had 42 weeks of chemotherapy in her first round of cancer. At that time, she was experienced, she, at that time she experienced a great deal of nausea, loss of appetite, and migraines. There were times when she would not eat for several days due to her malaise, nausea, and fatigue. She was deathly ill, and we did not know from day to day if she would live or die. The typical anti-nausea drug called Zofran was routinely used, but it did not work as effectively as Marinol pills, which she was given legally as a nausea and appetite inducer, as you may know. Marinol is a laboratory version of T THC sold by big pharmaceutical companies for about $1,400 for 30 or so pills. And that, as a side, uh, is costing the state of New Hampshire and Medicaid costs that amount of money. When you have insurance, the, the cost isn't much of an ins issue, but, when the, but the irony is that the real marijuana smoked while fresh is far more effective and more, much quicker to, to deliver the relief that a cancer patient needs than is Marinol, and even on the black market is far cheaper in pricing. For those without insurance, it is not only a better investment, but it works far quicker to deliver the relief needed. When, you're ch when your teenage daughter is deathly ill, and you need to do anything you can to make sure she gets the nutrition she needs, as well as helping her eliminate her severe nausea. You're inclined to do anything you can to provide that relief, even if it is illegally acquired. My daughter's treatment was initially successful, and after a year of hospitalization, she was able to come home and recuperate. She was still very weak and lacking in energy. We did anything we could in that second year of her cancer history to help her regain her energy. Although her tumor had shrunk about 20% and apparently died, it, had been, uh, it was not removed due to the extreme disability she would have had to suffer if it had been surgically removed. As a result of the tumor still remaining in her spine, it put pressure on her sacral S1 nerve and gave her extreme intermittent pain, depending on her level of physical activity. Her only workable options for pain relief were prescription painkillers, the dangerous kind, and marijuana, which was illegal but much safer to use. Although the marijuana did not become a total substitute for her pain medications, it was an effective supplement and also provided a spiritual boost that the pain medications could not deliver. She, so she continued to use Marinol by prescription and black market marijuana to help alleviate her pain as well as anxiety and stress from her difficult new life. She had many medical complications from the chemo and radiation following the first cancer bout, and when she made it to the five-year mark without any signs of cancer returning, we all rejoiced, thank God for sparing her life. She had a very restricted life compared to most normal kids because of her pain issues, but she made every attempt to resume a normal life with plans to get married and raise her own family. <coughs> then in her eighth year of freedom from cancer, she suddenly ex started experiencing new pain in the same areas as before at the base of her spine and her right hip bone. Within a few days, we found, cancer, found her cancer had returned, 
and this time her only hope for survival would be chem chemotherapy and radical surgery to remove the bottom of her spine and about half of her right iliac. Bravely, she first underwent nine weeks of chemo and then followed by two 15-hour radical surgeries where her surgeons removed the tumorous areas and replaced her bones with titanium rods fused to her spine and left and right hip bones. She suffered more than any soldier I've ever known from that surgery, and she was in the hospital and rehab centers for six months. Her strong will and determination brought her through that horror, and she continues today, two years after that surgery, to be determined to be able to walk again and be self-sufficient, though at present she is still bedbound tw basically 24-7. She is able to get around a little bit in her electric wheelchair and a walker. When she was in her second go-round with cancer, again she had to endure chemotherapy before and after her radical surgery. At those times she still suffered from extreme nausea and so Fran again did not help her enough. When I was able to acquire some medical marijuana from a neighboring state to let her try, she found immediate rel relief from the nausea and it also helped with her extreme depression. Very rapidly. We had to search and play the acquisition game in the black market to continue to help her but it was worth it. It brought her through those very difficult times better than any antidepressant or anti-anxiety drug that was available. And it helped alleviate her pain, which continues to be a reason for her using it from time to time. My daughter's journey has been difficult and trying for her and my wife and I. I know there are millions of other people in this world that will also testify that marijuana has been useful in their survival and tolerance of their long-term illnesses. To me, it is a hypocritical and twisted. It is hypocritical and twisted for our legal system to make this weed illegal, with its many beneficial qualities, while allowing tobacco to be sold without regard for its impact to our population health. I do not believe that our society should have the right to tell us what weeds we can and cannot grow. To me, this is an aberration of common sense and nature. What God has placed on this planet should not be considered illegal. To arrest, fine, and imprison people for, for the growing or smoking of the weed known as marijuana is not only pure irony, but a tragedy as well. Thousands of people's lives have been destroyed by their arrest and detention for possession of a common weed. The cost to society for this illegalization is extreme to the taxpayers, from law enforcement and incarceration costs to the wasting of lives of those incarcerated that might otherwise be productive members of society. The tax revenues lost by not allowing the legalization of marijuana is being realized all over the country today, with an estimated 80% of our population admitting they have either used marijuana in the past or are still using it. We only have to look at the states such as California, Colorado, and Washington to realize the tax revenues that the sale of marijuana could return to our state are substantial. Whether you suffer from migraine headaches, tumors, glaucoma, epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, depression, or obsessive compulsive disorder, this weed has proven to be effective and a, much, and a relief at a much lower cost than many of the pharmaceutical drugs that are ineffective and laden with side effects. I urge the New Hampshire Senate, with all due respect, to do the right thing and make the substance legal for those who need it. It's the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Questions for the committee? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> My name is Frank Payne, P-A-I-N-E, which is a very appropriate name for this subject. I testified before this committee about a year ago, and uh, I don't know whether those materials are still in your records, but I won't repeat them. I just want to add my support to this bill. About 20 years ago, I developed a chronic pain condition, which has been treated for at least half of that time with narcotic prescription narcotic painkillers. Also had major back surgery, implanted spinal cord stimulator, and a bunch of other things that I won't waste your time on at this point. None of it has worked. I am now retired, having initially gone on disability, which means basically I'm no longer productive. I am legitimately at retirement age, but 
there is nothing other than this condition that would prevent me from continuing to be able to contribute to myself, my family, and above all, to the community I live in. Now being New Hampshire, I come from the points farther south. I don't have a life-threatening condition, as many of people who are here have. I can drive a car, I can walk for a while, and I can do some things, but it's extremely limiting. And above all, I can identify with the chronic pain suffered by people who do have life-threatening conditions, because I've been there. I think it's above all cruel to withhold from such people the ability to treat themselves in whatever way is the most effective. And in this case, marijuana is still basically illegal. Sorry, we're supposed to take cannabis. My mistake. Uh, cannabis is still technically illegal, certainly at the federal level, and I don't need to tell you what it's, uh, it is here in the state of New Hampshire. I really urge you to approve this bill so that people who really need it can get it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. Any questions of the committee? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ann. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for letting me speak. My name's Annie Buckman. I'm here to represent my grandfather, Michael Dunlevy, Korean Marine, served in Vietnam, 75 years old. Three years ago, he suffered a bleeding ulcer in his stomach. And to keep him alive, they had to pump 26 units of blood into him. That's about enough blood for five people and they were able to save him. But it was a di direct result of his use of pain medication to deal with his arthritis and his chronic pain that is lowering his quality of life. So this is why it's important to us. It's really time sensitive. Every day is a challenge. Every day, every task. And we believe cannabis is the answer. We want to be able to grow it ourselves because that's the way that we're going to be able to afford it. I'll be able to grow the cannabis just like we grow other things in our garden. I have, I'm not used to public speaking, so I'm wicked nervous. <laughs> but I have some stuff written down here. So we're seeking the freedom to choose a natural, reliable, sustainable, safe, and affordable way to treat his chronic pain and arthritis. I want to be able to help provide a better quality of life to my grandfather without the risk of death we faced with the pain pills. This is literally a live free or die situation. And in regards with the pain medication, with what's going on in New Hampshire with the abuse of pain medication leading to the heroin epidemic, it is a huge concern in our household of break-ins now with pain meds. With cannabis, there's a certain process till it's ready for use as medicine. We, he's already been a victim of people breaking in because he's older and they know he's on pain medicine. People that knew him broke in, stole $1,000 from him, all his pain meds, his TV. And this is because of pain medicine. I don't believe that cannabis is going to make him more liable to be a victim of burglary. I believe this is going to protect him, our family, and especially our big concern is making sure that his medicine isn't going on to the street to be abused and leading to the heroin epidemic. I don't believe that cannabis, growing cannabis in our home is going to cost the state any more money. I believe it will save money. So just let us not let fear of a plant hold up our progress. This movement is unstoppable. And I hope New Hampshire takes a leadership role and sets an example of compassion and liberty to choose a natural treatment. Thank you. Semper Fi. Uh, oh, sorry. And, and you did a very good job. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All set? Thank you.
Thank you. For the record, my name is Daryl Perry. I'm one of the co-chairs of the New Hampshire Liberty Party. I am also someone who should probably be medicating with cannabis. I have had multiple concussions. I've had a headache for two years, seven months, about three weeks. I, I could calculate the exact number of days and hours if uh, necessary. Uh, there is a provision in here that I actually like the intent of. It's on page four. Uh, it says that uh, it's a new section, uh, begins at line four. If someone has a qualifying medical condition and does not possess a registry card, then you know they can basically not be charged with violation is my understanding of the intent here but the person must have submitted an application which means that they have to have the history with the doctor and you know i can't really afford to go see medical professionals and a lot of Doctors, especially in the past, haven't really ever tried to treat any of my symptoms. They just want to, you know, like, well, here's a drug, try it. If it doesn't work, I don't know what to do. So uh, I really like the intent of trying to open up who can use the therapeutic cannabis. I have no intentions of trying to grow on my own because I don't have a green thumb. Uh, pardon the pun there, but uh, everything that I have ever tried to grow pretty much dies. I, I used to have a cactus and it actually died. So I have no intention of trying to grow on my own, but I, I again just want to commend the uh, House and also the Senate for trying to expand who can use the cannabis and I think that this bill is definitely a start and hopefully it can be made better in the future and want to reemphasize what was uh, said by Mr. McNeil that uh, there's always HB 1625 that would decriminalize. I realize that that would not legalize but it might help me be able to find the cannabis in the form that I need to medicate. Thank you. Questions to the committee? Hi, thank you. My name is Donna Priolo. I'm a resident of Farmington, New Hampshire, and um, my friends call me Bumps. And I do remember speaking about a year ago, and at that time I was uh, maybe weeks away from getting my one year chip from AA. And the 18th of this month, I will get my two year chip. And alcohol is the way that I used to medicate after um, my bilateral mastectomy and to get me through the depression and everything that I went through with cancer. Uh, 2005, I was diagnosed with stage three cancer. And shortly after that, it was also quick, but my husband started growing cannabis for me. Um, he was very successful. I consider him a master grower. He did it without chemicals, without anything harmful for me and um, all natural, um, insecticides like neem oil so he is um, has helped me um, not depend on prescriptions at our pharmaceuticals as much um, at that time I was drinking and mixing my pharmaceuticals it was very helpful to numb my whole body and um, I didn't leave the house that much at all um, so coming through and lessening the alcohol, finding out that I had a problem and dealing with that. I don't want any more pharmaceuticals in my life. I don't want alcohol in my life. I only want cannabis. I don't use Tylenol. I don't use Motrin. I don't use Robitussin. Um, we order our, our, our herbs online. We capsulize them ourselves. And if we can grow it, we will. Um, my husband has since been diagnosed with hepatitis C and was growing again. Um, we did have a break in between and 
our daughter called the police on us out of act, an act of rebellion and um, he was arrested. But they did not arrest me, although it was mine as well. Um, on the bottom of the search warrant, they said Mr. Priolo does not appear to be sick. They didn't ask us, talk to us about it or anything. We had to go fight for it. We had to go in front of the judge. We had to submit all of our medical paperwork. And we um, threatened with jury nullification, which judge told everybody to get it taken care of out of court as fast as we could. So it was, and he was sentenced with a misdemeanor, no jail time, no fine, and um, a big, huge bill, over $10,000 for us to fight this, and we didn't even have to take it all the way. Um, so that has taken a lot of time and energy out of our family life. Um, my daughter's 15, my son is um, going to be 12, and it has grown our family to be closer. We are more open with them. They know all about cannabis and how healthy and good it is for everybody. Um, my daughter recently made hemp milk out of the hemp seeds and filtered water, and um, we put hemp hearts on our food daily. So. They know all the benefits all the way across. They know that the, the children that use it for epilepsy are not getting high off of it and it's not being any, it, there's no harm done to these children and we do know one boy in Maine that is going through the process um, now. So there hasn't been any harm. We're open and honest. We're not hiding anything that is dangerous or anything about it. Just what has, and they've seen everything that's going through with the um, legal process of it. Um, we know people with cancer, we know that they, they could use it, but how do we help them? And I do believe that my husband will be able to help people. And if there's anybody in this room, if this law passes, you know you can come to us. Some of you all know us, and Rich will be there to help you. And um, I really am hoping that everybody will get their two plants and that we can do this the right way and we can do it successfully and we will come together and we will help each other where we don't know and we're not educated enough. Um, it is different to grow it and um, you know, with the education out there, it, it, it's possible and it's healthy and even with the dispensaries, I mean, who are we trusting there? We don't really know and if you do say it's, oh, the state will pick the people, da da da. Where are they coming from and who are they that are going to grow our medicine? I don't understand how we can give it to somebody else but not trust us in our home, own homes where it's been proven, we've done it a couple times, to not affect our children or our life in a negative way. Questions for Senator Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for coming and congratulations on your almost two year jail. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, do you ever worry that use of uh, marijuana will impact your sobriety? No, and actually I've done reading and there is a cannabis made with low THC or I don't know how much uh, percentage with a high CBD that helps people in AA um, with their detox and it helps them with the shakes and it gives, gives their body a calmness to go through it without any other harmful drugs. Further questions of the night? Thank you. Thanks. Rich? Priolo. Priolo. <coughs> Thank you. My name is Richard Priolo from Farmington, New Hampshire. That was my wife that just spoke, and I won't retell the information that she gave. Um, I'm a Christian. I'm a Marine. I'm a war veteran. I have hepatitis C. Uh, been diagnosed with PTSD. So you have two people with qualifying conditions inside the house. Um, I would just like to emphasize how important it is for us to be able to grow our own medicine. Not only for the cost, but that we could grow the, the strain that we would like to be able to make food for patients that don't want to, that don't want to smoke it. It's very important. Um, to have our own choice is important. And I would like to also stress how it's important to protect the patients. Allowing this to go through to protect patients, even though the police say they're not arresting sick people, they do. They, they, they've been trained to go after the plant. Um, we just heard earlier that they need more training to even identify the plant, let alone be able to see qualifying conditions in patients or no. They're gonna go for the plant first, they're gonna worry about that stuff later. People need to be protected from this. 
this kind of hardship on sick people, thousands of dollars, you know, uh, all this time later, it's just totally unnecessary. We're talking about a, a non-toxic plant here that is safe and effective for people. And I would just like to emphasize that people need protection from, from the police and, you know, and from, from ridicule from other people, from society, the effect that it has on other people in your town look at you like you're a criminal, like you're a drug dealer when you go to your child's softball game and you're the one that got arrested in your town. Otherwise, you're a good church-going, productive citizen in society. But it's just this one plant that makes us seem this way. So I would just, uh, I would like to emphasize that this should pass. And thank you for hearing me. Questions of the committee? Thank you so much. Support, doesn't indicate whether you're speaking or not. Excuse me, just a second. Thank you, Madam Chair, part of the committee. Great to see you again. For the record, Matt Simon. I live in Goffstown. I'm New England political director for the Marijuana Policy Project. And I know you're all very well informed and aware of these issues, and you've all been supportive in the past, so thank you for that. Um, just a couple things. I don't want to keep it very long. I got a call this morning uh, from former Representative Evelyn Merrick. She has a terrible cold. She wanted to be here today. She apologized. She begged me to read her very brief testimony. I think it's about that. Um, honorable Senators, for the record, I am former State Representative Evelyn Merrick from Lancaster. I championed the medical marijuana legislative effort for many years. I'm a prime sponsor of legislation in 2009. I spent three terms plus a year fighting for the therapeutic use of the cannabis bill that's now law. I'm here in strong support of 1622 and will share a brief but profound story to reinforce the intent of this legislation. My dearest friend, I will call her Mary, is in end stage cancer. I've known Mary for 33 years. She's never smoked, never drank alcohol, and is anti-recreational drug use. I just spent three days caring for Mary, watching her ingest four different legal forms of pain-killing drugs every two to three hours, 24-7. Her pain continued to be unrelenting. She couldn't eat, being nauseous all the time from the pain meds. It was heart-wrenching to witness her suffering. The only adjunct therapy that brought any effective relief, a break from the excruciating bone pain, the nausea, and the inability to eat, was marijuana. Against every fiber of her being, Mary reluctantly agreed to use it in her home as she is unable to leave, knowing she was ultimately breaking law, knowing the risks, but desperate for relief. The effects were immediate and visibly profound. This woman is a brilliant, talented, productive, and honorable member of society who is losing her battle to cancer and must break the law to find some relief and peace in her final days because the legal avenue isn't available yet. Even though Mary meets the criteria to be an approved card-carrying patient, should she be at risk for doing so, should she be made to feel like a criminal, Mary doesn't have the time to wait until treatment centers are open for business. I ask you from every fiber of my being, please pass HB 1622 Send it on to Governor Hassan with the bipartisan, unanimous, resounding endorsement and message. It's time to help stop the suffering by allowing a temporary legal growing option. Thank you, Honorable Senators, for your time, Evelyn Mayor. I meant to hand these out first. Thank you. Kind of summarize that. Absolutely. I, I, I will so absolutely do that. To I'll only t touch on <laughs> things that, um, I'll only update you on things you don't know. Clayton Holton, Clayton Holton I talked to last week. He's been here many times. I'm sure you remember him. He always gives us an update on his weight. Uh, when he was in California a few years ago, it got up as high as 88 pounds and he was doing pretty well. And last year he told us he was at 70 pounds. Um, a year ago, Friday, actually. He's unable to travel now. He's living in a nursing home in Dover. He's 60 pounds. And his current situation is still what it was. He has to take, you know, prescription pain medicine, which further kills his appetite. And if he's able to nibble on a brownie or a cookie, it makes all the world of difference. So any of us sitting here who are feeling compassionate one day, maybe a little rebellious, if we were to take Clayton a cookie or a brownie today, we would be committing a felony. 
we would be risking up to three years in jail, a fine of up to $25,000. Clayton would only be risking up to a year in jail, up to a $2,000 fine for possessing it. That's what we're trying to change here. These patients have come year after year. You know their stories. Uh, I've given you two editorials published by Ron Mitchell, who's a patient that had to move to Vermont. He would love to move back, but he's in Vermont and he has his two plants and he can't move back until something like this passes. A lot of patients don't want to grow their own plants. They would much rather buy from a dispensary, but we've heard over the years from patients like the Prelos who are comfortable with cultivation, who understand cultivation, who frankly feel much better about all of this if they're able to grow the plants themselves. They don't trust some outside company not knowing how things are going to be done. Finally, we heard from the Department of Safety, actually I want to comment on the conditions. In the House hearing on another bill, you might wonder why the heck epilepsy and lupus and those things are, are in this bill. Representative Wright added those uh, things to this bill after another bill was set to enter a study in the House. The other bill would have added those conditions and the members of law enforcement who testified at that hearing said they did not object to adding those specific conditions. So unless they want to renew their objections to any of it, I don't think that should be a sticking point in this bill. The bill, for example, already includes seizures. So I think it was the clear intent of the legislature to protect epileptic patients. Adding epilepsy merely completes that and makes it, remember you have to have something from the first list and something from the second list. And with that structure of definition, some things needed to be done. So I don't think that would be controversial. We also heard uh, just now from safety that uh, they don't have the resources to regulate home cultivation, that that would be additional resources. I just want to point out the Department of Safety very probably couldn't or wouldn't be authorized to go into patients' homes anyway. That would be a violation of the Fourth Amendment. There is no state that allows police officers to go into patients' home without probable cause and search their grow facility. Montana is the only state that ever had that in the law, and before any patient was ever searched, a court said, no, you can't do that. And the state itself said, we're fine with that and having that part of the law rejoined, Fourth Amendment. Um, there are a few states that allow the health department to, if they want to, go in and inspect. There's no requirement that they do so, but the health department may do it. So I think what's in here is consistent with that. I don't think this bill requires anybody to inspect, but the local locals can. So that's all I have. Thank you, Thank you. Um, thank you Matt. Um, let me ask you, the other bill that's been referenced is 1625, which is the decriminalization bill of up to an ounce of marijuana, um, which passed by strong veto-proof majority. Um, that, if that bill passed out of the Senate, say, even in a lesser amount, would that solve this short-term problem? I don't believe it would solve anything at all for these patients. <coughs> I would urge you to consider those two bills as being two totally different entities. The HB 1625 does not give anybody safe legal access to marijuana. It doesn't allow anybody to grow anything. It does reduce penalties for cultivation of up to six plants to a misdemeanor, but that's still a criminal offense. So it would somewhat reduce <coughs> Uh, the risks that some of these people are taking, but it would not give them legal protection. It would not give them safe legal access. And I, you know, I, I, I look at this as an issue that's come up many times before. Last year, strategically, home cultivation had to come out of this bill, but there are many patients who will never be happy, I don't think, with, with a law that says they're a felon if they grow a marijuana plant, that they have to buy it from one specific store. We have hundreds of pharmacies in this state that people can choose from. And to say you have to go to one alternative treatment center and who knows who's going to be running it before we even have any clue. I would further comment that we have no idea when the ATCs can get up and running and that despite the best intentions of absolutely everybody, there's no way to make that happen. Local approval might be an issue for some of these entities. Zoning might be an issue. They have to hire people. They have to grow the plants. They have to start a complicated business, in short. And they have to be vertically integrated. They have to produce all their own products. They have to do everything themselves. So it's not a small undertaking. We all knew it would take time. 
That's all. That's why we all testified so passionately for home cultivation last year, in the middle of the hearing last year. Several of us, including Mr. Payne uh, and Christine Lopez, went to meet with the governor right in the middle of this hearing a year ago to beg her to support this, and, and now we're here begging you to let people have two plants, please. Other questions? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Our representative uh, Emily Sandberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Emily Sandblade. I'm uh, a representative from Hillsborough 18, uh, which is on the west side of Manchester. And I'm here to um, talk about why the option to grow a small amount of cannabis is necessary for a population that I serve. Uh, in my real life outside the legislature, and we all have real lives, uh, I happen to be the food production manager for New Horizons uh, for New Hampshire which is a homeless shelter, a rather large homeless shelter, soup kitchen, and food pantry in Manchester. They do wonderful work. They serve 100,000 meals a year. They provide groceries to 1,000 families a month. And of course, they provide shelter, especially in the coldest parts of the year, like we've had this last winter, to people who have no place to go. Uh, we'd rather see you know, people camping in the hallways at New Horizons than out dying along the river banks of the Merrimack River. That's how, how strongly we believe in our mission. Um, one of the things that I get to do as the uh, food production manager is I work with a lot of people. They come in and they volunteer to work in the greenhouses uh, so that we can grow all the uh, fruits and vegetables that we possibly can that will be consumed inside the, the, uh, the uh, food pantry and the soup kitchen. One of the things that I've noticed about a lot of the people that I work with is their health is drastically compromised. It, uh, there are just so many people who uh, show up at, at New Horizons who are suffering from HIV disease, they're suffering from cancers, they're suffering from multiple sclerosis. There's a lot of different, different uh, health conditions that they're suffering from. And the consequences of malnutrition and homelessness for these people has been to put them into an even worse position than most of the people that you would ever see come in front of your committee. These are people who are desperate, some of them are desperately, desperately ill. And what we try to do at New Horizons is we have a real focus to getting people independent again, back into a home of some sort or another, uh, for the ones that, that uh, uh, are capable of working, which you know I grant some of them aren't, but for the ones that are capable of working, we try to get them into jobs, we try to get them out to be productive members of society again. But we've got a long ways to go on that sometimes. And sometimes when we get people back into their own home, it's just bare, they're barely getting by. Some of them are existing on as little as about $650 a month. They are not, a lot of the clients at New Horizons are not in a position where they can possibly afford the cost in an ATC. It's just not going to happen. These people are completely, almost completely shut out of that system. They are in the position where if they want to deal with their, the symptoms from the cancer or from the HIV disease or from MS or whatever, they're in the position where they can't. There's no option right now. I've gotten to be friends with a lot of these people and it really bother, bothers me a lot to think that these people are dying and they're, they're, they're dying worse than they need to. You know, they, they're, they're, they're suffering terribly. And uh, they are no less human beings because they happen to be poor. And they're no less human beings because they happen to be homeless. And they're no less human beings because they happen to be sick. Some of these people would be served very, very well by being able to grow a plant or two in their house. You know, and they're a lot of them rooming houses, you know, uh, small, tiny facilities that they're living in. We get them, we don't, we don't, we don't send them off to Cadillac facilities. Uh, we just don't. We don't have that kind of money. New Horizons is mostly privately financed, very little public financing. You know, our, our mission is to get people to be independent and to get them into a life. Part of that life, if you've only got $650 or $1,000 a month, which is about the range that we see for a lot of these people, a lot of them are on disability. 
you know, like uh, one gentleman I know who's a double amputee, uh, he's existing on $650 a month of Social Security disability. There is just no way you can go to, to any sort of dispensary or ATC or whatever and spend $200 to $400 for something that would make your life tolerable. And so even though not all of them have green thumbs, I have one. I have two. <laughs> That's why I'm gr directing growing operations, uh, food growing operations at New Horizons. Um, some of them don't have green thumbs, but for the ones they are, this is an option that will make their life tolerable. For some of them, it will definitely extend their life because, you know, if you can't eat, you don't live long. And it would really, really make a big difference for hundreds of our clients to be able to have access to this option. So I'm urging, uh, please, I mean, this, uh, you know, I believe that this is the right thing, which is why I co-sponsored this bill. Um, please consider voting in favor of it because there's, there's just many hundreds of people just in Manchester. And if we multiply that, Manchester is about, what, about a, t a twelfth of the state. If we multiply the numbers of hundreds in Manchester that we serve times the entire state, we're talking, you know, several thousand people. Uh, that, that could really use this option. And there are people who are really quite desperate. There are people who are in poor health as a rule, not as an exception. And, and, and we really need to be able to, to do something for them, um, something that's, that's really fairly low cost and reasonable. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for the work that you do. Questions for the committee? Okay. Thank none, you. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll still have three people. Um, we have Kathleen um, in support but not speaking. We have Mike Dorney in support but not speaking. We have Chris Lopez in support but not speaking. Hi. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Yes. Um, I appreciate the support that uh, you've given uh, so far. I just wanted, I'll be really brief. Um, I've been paralyzed for a little over two years and as a result of that I uh, experienced severe muscle spasms in the lower half of my body and I found with um, cannabis I'm able to find immediate relief from that by either smoking or by eating um, it and I really would appreciate the opportunity to grow my own plants so that I can have access to that and get the relief that I sorely need. Thank you. Thank you. Questions of the committee? Thank you so much for coming here. Mm -hmm. um, Willie Brown. Hello, everybody. Thank you for listening to me. I just, I'll be very brief. A couple of quick important things. One of the things that I want to say is very important here that just seems to be going by people all the time. And that is, is that marijuana is not what we were told it was. It's not the bad thing we were told it was back during the Nixon administration. We found out it was all a farce that we were taught. Right here I'm holding the, war, uh, the report for the Global Commission for the War on Drugs. This is all anybody needs if you want to become educated as to drugs being used in the United States and what they're doing, then read this report. If you want to know the best things that we should be doing as a society for our people, read this report. If you haven't read this report, and you're giving opinions and you're making decisions based on good information, but you haven't read the Global Commission report on drugs, I would say that you're probably not given the best decision that you could give if you don't read it, because there's too many important things in there that it talks about that are key issues that we need to deal with when it comes to people using marijuana and using drugs in our society. We need to get smarter. We need to do things a lot differently than the way we used to do them. Prohibition gets you nothing good for your society. Anytime you prohibit, you create black markets. There's so many issues that people will sidetrack people when they try to legalize marijuana. They'll say, oh geez, uh, you know, we're gonna have to start trying to determine what kind of plants are marijuana. We're gonna have to start trying to have people working, trying to determine what, who's using marijuana and all of these different problems that you're saying the police are gonna have to have extra people on the force to determine this and determine that. Well, they're not gonna be going around arresting people for marijuana anymore, so they're gonna have more time to go around and look into things and check things out, and that's not gonna be a problem. Lyndon Johnson once said, 
Do not view legislation in the light of the benefits it can convey to you, but look at it in, the, in light of the dangers and the harms that it can cause people when it's administered improperly. I take the global report right here, and in the global report, the global report, by the way, has eight presidents of eight different countries. They have very intelligent people in this commission, in this group of people from Switzerland, Germany, Norway, uh, Brazil, South America. We've got Paul Volcker, the treasurer, secretary of treasury for the United States. This group of people sat down and they looked at all the problems in all societies around the world in depth views. We have financial people, we have doctors, we have political people in here, and this report lays it all out. It, you couldn't make a better decision based on good information than when you got right here in this report. And this report here, one thing I want to mention, when I came in, I heard Senator Reagan make the comment how he thinks it's uh, embarrassing or how uh, ashamed that you know, our society, our government has allowed marijuana to be legalized so easily. Well, if you read this Global Commission report, it says one of the first things that we need to do is recognize, um, what does it say here? The global war on drugs has failed with devastating consequences for individuals and societies around the world. I'm sorry, I don't have my glasses, so it's a little difficult for me to see. But the bottom line is, the reality is, is uh, like he said, the harms and the dangers that it causes others when administered improperly. That's what's happening. That's the harms. We say, let's regulate this. Let's not allow people to do, you know, um, have marijuana, grow marijuana. Well, somebody else is going to go do it. Someone's going to do it on the black market. They're going to get the money for it. It's going to get sold. Marijuana is everywhere already. It's already out there. Everybody's using it. And you know what? Society didn't need government. We didn't need uh, committees to sit down and say, how much should someone smoke? How much should they buy? How much can they get? Who's going to record them? Who's going to watch them? Who's going to pay the people to record them and watch them? The, the principle of parsimony. It is pointless to do with more what can be done with less. Think about it. 21 and older, alcohol, I mean, marijuana legal like alcohol. 21 and older. You don't have to figure out how many of the guy's smoking or how many cookies he's eating. He can regulate. Guess what? They're adults. They can make decisions for themselves on what they can do. Regulate marijuana, tax it, use the money to educate people about what it does, point out the pros and cons of it, let people understand what it is. The bottom line is, is does it make sense to go through all of these problems, to have all these committees and meetings and try to figure out what to do with it? Just let the people do what they've been doing right along. For the last 60 years, we didn't need government telling us how to use marijuana. But the bottom line is, is look at it for what it really is. It's not the bad thing we were told it was. You know something? The governor talks about not wanting to spread marijuana around the state and give it to people. Well, the governor likes to tell everybody, go ahead, have some vodka, drink up. Hey, we want to restore the restoration, the flag restoration fund. You know, no, 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 no. Yes, that's true. That's true. For you, it's you don't like that. The bottom line is, is it's the truth. Is that not the governor? Is she not selling vodka? Was she not promoting vodka to people in the state? Yes, she was. Does vodka is vodka bad for you physically? Too much of it? Abused? Yes, it is. Let's talk about the bill. Yeah. Okay. Well, the bottom line is, is someone needs to be talking to the governor. Because there seems to be a gap between the citizens of the state and the governor's office. And it seems, as well as today, from what I'm seeing, it almost seems like there's a gap between the senators and the, the governor. Because nobody seems to be talking. I tried to see the governor. I wrote seven letters, eight letters to the governor. Couldn't get five minutes with the governor. I wrote to all the senators that I saw voted against marijuana in the last vote, and not one person, one person, got back to me, said they would meet with me to talk with me, and didn't show up for the meeting. I never got a letter saying, sorry I didn't show up for the meeting. That's the communication I got with my senators and representatives trying to talk to them. I don't understand where we're missing the information from the global report that tells all, makes all common sense, well thought out, all the people you can imagine that could get together and do a report like this that you want to are right here. So the bottom line is. Excuse me? You have an extra copy of I'll tell you what, I'll give you mine. 
because I'm just happy to see somebody show the interest in it. Thank you very much. I was going to make copies for everybody, but then with the response I got back after writing all my senators and asking them to talk with me a few minutes to speak about some information I had that I thought might help them make better decisions, nobody thought it was that important to get back to me. So I don't understand what you people do here exactly after we come here and talk, but I'm hoping eventually the end result will be that we'll listen to intelligent people who take the time to do investigations and point out to people who need to know us that that's what needs to be done. The bottom line is, is we've been doing it all wrong. It's all right here in the report. Anybody wants to make good decisions, read the report. As far as the state police, I have all the respect in the world for the Empress State Police. They're wonderful people. We're lucky to have them. And I have all the respect for them. But the reality is, is one is not what we were told it was. And uh, people really need to start communicating. The governor, I would like to know what the governor knows that all of these people in this cl global commission does not know. Well, because. If you, leave, if you leave your uh, contact information with me, I'll make sure you get this back. You can have it, it's a gift for me. I, you can put it out on the, on the internet, anybody. Global Commission War on Drugs Report. Print it out, read it, educate yourselves, make good decisions. And that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I want to speak in favor of this bill, but with a couple of concerns I think should be addressed. What's your name? I'm Ian Freeman. I'm from Keene. Uh, in, in this bill, is my understanding, there's a 30-mile uh, radius restriction, meaning that one could not grow one's own plants if one were a patient, if there's a uh, facility within 30 miles of, of one's house. And I'd like to say that that seems kind of silly. Uh, there are certain reasons why and unnecessarily restrictive. Certain reasons why, as a grower, uh, one would want to be able to grow one's own product as opposed to using the facilities or using the product of someone else who you may not necessarily agree with their methods. There are different types, different ways, as I'm sure you know, to grow cannabis, and certain growers have preferences. They should be able to uh, make that choice for themselves whether or not they happen to live nearby one of these facilities. So that's a concern that I have with this. And in addition, uh, I, it just seems silly to me. I, I'm just going to echo briefly some of the concerns that people have said here today. Well, I, I'm just blown away that we're talking about whether people can grow a plant in the supposedly live free or die state. We're talking about a weed that grows in nature. And here there's all this discussion and all these years spent deciding now maybe people will be able to grow two plants in their own home, but if you grow a third plant, you could go to a jail cell. I mean, just the, the absurdity of it all is so striking to me. I would hope that maybe not on this, this time around, but eventually people will be able to grow however many plants they want. And finally, I just want to support uh, also the idea of decriminalization. It'll be a good way for other people to not feel so frightened around the idea of having this plant on their person. Because as we all know, as the last speaker in indicated, marijuana is everywhere in New Hampshire. It's everywhere in the United States. It's not going anywhere. And we're not making people's lives better by putting them in jail cells for it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do you want to drive anyone to the bottom? Come on. <coughs> Perhaps you could tell us the status of the agency. Certainly. Good afternoon. Pardon my voice. I've got a bit of cold. <clears throat> uh, my name is Michael Holt with the Department of Health and Human Services and the Administrative Rules Unit. Um, House Bill 573 mandates that the department uh, issue licenses to up to four, but a minimum of two ATCs, 18 months after the passage of the act. This brings us to January 2015. It is our intent to issue those licenses, um, or at least select the um, um, select the ATCs that we will issue the licenses to um, by that date. We're in the process of writing the rules um, for the regulation of these facilities. Um, that's going steadily and slowly. We're working very hard um, to get those, uh, those rules <clears throat> written and in place. 
based on those rules, we'll also be needing to write an RFP um, for uh, potential applicants. Um, the rules need to be done prior to the, um, the RFP being released. Again, we hope to get the rules through the jail car process by the um, August, September, um, issue the RFP sometime in the fall. These are, these are targets, these are time frames. So, um, and, uh, as you know, an RFP process takes a number of months and you know, in order to issue those licenses by January, we would need to meet this aggressive schedule. Cards. We're not able to do the cards until the attorney general issued an opinion that said that the department should not. It was their recommendation that the department should not issue cards until the ATCs were open, and the department is abiding by the attorney general's opinion. Okay. Could you um, speak to something else that um, someone has come in and spoken to me about recently? that I know nothing about, so I'm going to ask you if you can help me out with that. Um, did the bill that we passed say that the physician had to be a New Hampshire physician or could be a physician from outer state or anything else to issue the prescription? Uh, the pr provider is a defined term in the statute. Um, it it, it, it uh, allows for physicians and APRNs uh, to be a provider, and both of those uh, physicians and APRNs need to be licensed in New Hampshire. Thank you, Madam Chairman. If I could just add to what he had to say about the, the, just the alternative treatment centers. What we're missing in understanding how, how this is going to work is the fact that once somebody obtains an alternative treatment center license, now they're going to have to go to a town and go through the zoning and planning process. Having been a member of a planning board for 12 years myself, I understand the concept of not in my backyard. And that's going to make a great deal of difficulty for these folks to get the, just start, just to get through the process. So bear that in mind. I would say on any other big project like this, even in a small town, can take up to a year. And that's before they even get their license to start. So after they've gone a year through that zoning and planning uh, uh, process, then they'll have to construct a building. And then once the building is completed, then the four month growth process starts. So we're looking at sometime in 2017 before we realistically see these things come up. But and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else to uh, speak on? House Bill 1622, and that's what we're here. Thank you very much for having me.